Got it. Ta -da! I'm live, finally live. <clears throat> All right, ladies and gentlemen, I had a few hiccups, but we are happening and uh, I'm just, uh, where did I put that? Where did I put you? Oh, here we are. I, this is where I put you. And <laughs> where did you put me, Kathy? Here's the music. <laughs> Kirk Lights.
Fofum. I've heard that before, but I didn't know that that was the name of it. <clears throat> yeah, one of those classic Wayne tunes. It's really great, man. Really great. <laughs> so my guest isn't. It, oh yeah, <laughs> my friend Roland says love that CD collection. <laughs> yeah, and that's only a part of it, actually. You know, I, I um. I was addicted from a very young age because I grew up in my mother's record store. Oh, oh yeah, right. I read that. Yeah, and so uh, I didn't get it for free, but I worked a lot in the store, and that's how I afforded to <laughs> have all those records and then CDs. And uh, like I said, this is a part of it. <laughs> you didn't get it for free? No, <laughs> but uh, I, I got a good deal, though. Oh. <laughs> uh. Well, that's that's pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I read that. And and did I read also that you now run the store? No, the store the store uh, was sold a few years back, and uh, now it folded. You know, the the whole industry changed so much. And uh, my mom had this incredible store that was specialized in jazz and classical music, oh. and for over twenty five years, wow. it kept growing and. Uh, and then somebody very arrogant bought it and said, uh, I'm going to show you how to run a record store. And then three years later, it was gone. You know, <laughs> that's, that's how it goes. Right. And uh, but um, people still stop her in the street and say, why? Why did you go? You know, we need you. <laughs> I mean, it's so great to have a real bookstore, or a real record store that you can go to and, and get the real advice, you know, and people know your taste and they, they know how to challenge it and how to, to how to make you discover stuff, you know, and it's so important. Yeah, yeah, that's really uh, that's that's a piece of valuable history there. Right. Really I mean, it goes it goes a little further than that in my roots because my father was born in his father's record store. Oh. Yeah, my grandfather also had a record store, but he died very young. Uh, he died um, in 1948. My father was 16 then, so I never I never met him, of course. But um, he was also a record producer and produced some sessions with Django Reinhardt and people like that. Grandfather. And my grandfather, yeah. Oh, jeez. I know, yeah. Wow, that's pretty cool history. Yeah, it's amazing. Is that, uh, well, obviously, I'm, I mean, I'm asking kind of a duh question, but <laughs> that's that's why you got into your love for, for jazz, especially probably, right? Definitely. I mean, I really, I, I'm going to put you a little louder here so I can hear you better. Oh. I, um, I have a passion for music in general, you know, because she was specialized in jazz and classical, but she had everything else. She was the, the, the first record store in Belgium to have albums by uh, Pink Floyd or Dire Straits or, you know, interesting music from every different style. She, she loved, she loves, she's still around uh, music from Brazil, from Africa, from everywhere. And so I, I listened to all that and it was like, to put it in, in Toot Stillman's words, it's like taking a musical shower every day. Yeah. And then, you know, you dry yourself, but a few drops stay in your hair. <laughs> and so I, I love music, and uh, but I always had a very 
close relationship with jazz. And, and my mom told me that when I was three years old, I would come into the, the kitchen and ask for something improvising on the music that was going going on in the house. So I guess that, that was it for me. <laughs> you know, um, last night I went to see uh, my friend Nick Mancini, who's a wonderful vibes player, really, truly like great. And he had a freaking amazing band. He's worked with these two guys in LA like for a long time. I, I met Turkman Oglu on bass, who's just really wonderful. He he actually got his doctorate. He's kind of he's young and he but he's just wow, he's a great bass player. If you ever come back to LA, I'm gonna yeah. hook you up. And Steve Haas cool. on drums, who's the perfect drummer. He's mm -hmm. like loose, but his time is impeccable and he's mm -hmm. creative and he's you know, it's just great. And this really great sax player who Nick knew from Tulsa named Clark Gibson. Okay. And, um, so anyway, but <laughs> there was this one song they were playing. I forget what it was, but it was it was really utilizing space, right? You know, it was just beautiful. It was just the magic was totally there. And it was a house concert. And this little girl who was probably, I don't know, five probably about five she was she was whistling oh. <laughs> and I thought to myself should I be the bad you know <laughs> the bad lady well, and tell her not at that to age you don't have a great control of pitch right that's the problem but strangely enough she was totally in the pitch and oh, she wow. was in there but you know and it was soft enough so that <laughs> probably not everybody heard it but I heard we were in the front <laughs> I heard it, and Nick looked at me like, <laughs> I almost said something, but I was like, I didn't want to be the bad, the bad lady, you know? Mm. <laughs> yeah, especially when kids are so into the music, it's, it's to be encouraged rather than, yeah. Yeah, yeah. right. Like, cool. I can just imagine you, you know, coming over oh, to yeah. your mom must have been pretty struck by that, you know? Yeah, well, she told me that uh, when she was pregnant with me, she went to hear Ella sing and I was dancing in her belly the whole night. So that's where my love for vocalists started. <laughs> <laughs> you do have a love for vocalists, don't you? I do. And as we were saying before, we were talking in terms of vocalists as musicians, not just singers and musicians. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. yeah, you are a real musician. I mean, it's been a while since we've played together, but uh, I, I loved your sense of, of time and uh, the ballads you chose to sing. And uh, you're, you're great with ballads. You, you put a lot of so much, so much feeling. And uh, and at the same time, it's crystal clear that you know exactly what's going on harmonically and everything. It's really it's really beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I've been um, reviewing like some movies that I've done, you know, just casual, casual movies, uh -huh. you know, gigs. And uh, it's really interesting to listen again, you know, and um, see, uh, well, I guess it's really, you know, it's kind of haphazard which gigs turn out fabulous, <laughs> you know, and which, which gigs are just, yeah, okay, that was, yeah, okay. But, um, yeah, I was reviewing one about nine years ago at the Blue Whale, mm -hmm. and it was with a guitar trio, you'll be happy to know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you know Jeff Richmond? Not personally, no. You know his name? I've heard his name, yeah. yeah. He's kind of like a West Coast Schofield. Oh, wow. He's really good. He's one of my favorite players. So it was with him and a few other guys that you probably don't know here, but... Uh, we had a lot of fun and I was, I was definitely in the Duende, you know, it was, <clears throat> it was really, um, it was a good space. And that's, <clears throat> of course, the, the, the space that we have to get into as quickly as possible. And you and I are experienced enough that usually we can enter into it right away, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I mean, it's always, it's always interesting for me because I, I, I used to be the, the shyest person of on earth. You know, I, I used to be so scared to be on stage. 
and now I feel more comfortable on stage than anywhere else. You know, it took a while, but this is really my space. This is where I'm supposed to be. And um, I always get nervous before going on stage, but once I'm there and the sound is right, you know, that's that's of course a very important part of it because if you have a, a an uncomfortable sound, then it's really hard to really focus and. Uh, it takes a while to really feel the the band with you, and then feel the larger circle with with the with the audience with you. You know, it's like you have to get out of yourself into the band, and then out of the band into the audience. It's like these these uh, common circles that are that are uh, bigger and smaller, and uh, somehow, you know, I was I was so fortunate to have to have real mentors. Uh, my first mentor was Toots Tielemans and the second one was Lee Konitz and uh, and both of them were playing the whole band. They were not just playing themselves, they were playing the whole band. And yeah. and this is when, when I'm at the my, my happiest, is when I feel like I'm playing the whole band and the whole band is playing me. Exactly. You know, and then you can you can export that into into the the audience and see how they react to it and how they influence you. You know. Yes. You know what? Yeah. What's so interesting? Um, I mean, it's not surprising, but it's interesting. So uh, for years, and Roland, you've heard me say this, and everybody has, listening has heard me say this a, lo a lot. So I have this concept that I teach singers. Mm -hmm. um, but it can be applied to anybody because you just said it. There's three universes. Uh -huh. That's going to blow your mind because it's exactly <laughs> what you said. So the first universe is <clears throat> your universe and you have to know what you're doing. Right. And you have to be good. You know, I mean, you have to do your best and that's, you know this. And then that universe expands to the musicians. And that's what's in that universe, you and the musicians. So anything can happen. There's no mistakes. You know, it's just it's magic mm -hmm. <clears throat> or, or you, that's where you create the magic. And then the third universe expands to the audience. And a lot of times beginning singers start with the third universe, which is, really, uh -huh. you know, interesting. Yeah. Um, and those those are those are the kind of non musician singers, you know, they because they don't get it. You right. Know, they don't get you know what's supposed to be happening there yeah because they don't know what they're listening to either you know they're they're when they're watching a concert or something they're they're just listening with their eyes and they they see that there's a rapport between the between the people on stage and the audience but they don't get what it entails you know what all the all the all the like you said you have to be prepared you have to be prepared so you can deal with all the stuff you cannot prepare you know <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Have you, I mean, you've played with so many people over the years and been friends with so many people like Toots and on and on. Um, were there some people that uh, were especially either mentors for you or uh, like people who told you something that really changed your life? Sure. I mean, the most important ones were, were Toots and, and Lee Konitz. But so many people told me invaluable information, you know, inv invaluable, I mean, like, like treasures that, that totally, that I'm still carrying with me and that hopefully I can, I can also share with the, the people who are studying with me and with the, mu the young musicians that I'm playing with. But um, one thing I'll never forget is in my first quintet, you know, that's when I was still very, very shy. I mean, my first gigs, I was hiding behind a drummer. You could not see me on stage, you know, it was like in a, in a fetal position. You could hear me. I was always loud, <laughs> but you couldn't see me. <laughs> but um, this drummer, this fantastic drummer, Felix Simtan, uh, who was a dear friend of Mel Lewis's and, and people like that, great drummer. He had a great big band here called Act Big Band uh, with the pianist Michel Hare. And Felix was part of my first quintet. I was, I was so, I mean, that was my second real band. Yeah. And uh, I was so honored to have him in there. And there was also a veteran bass player, Jean-Louis Baudouin, who was his old friend. And then two other young people with me, 
uh, a woman pianist, Nathalie Laurier, who got a great career after that, and uh, and uh, Erwin Van on tenor sax. So we were the three youngins with the, <laughs> with the two real veterans, you know. And uh, we played a really good gig. And I was being myself, so just sitting, having my eyes closed shut, sitting next to the tenor player, not saying anything, just playing, you know. And so after the gig, the drummer came to me and I said, so what do you think? It was good, huh? He said, yeah, I love the music, man, but I'm quitting your band. I said, what do you mean you're quitting my band? He says, you have no respect for your audience. I said, that's not true. I, I, I have so much respect for the people who come to hear me. That's why I work so hard on the music and everything. You know, he says, yeah, but you don't get it. You're not looking at them. You're not talking with them. You don't stand up when you're playing a solo. I quit. And so I say, please, Felix, stay. I'm going to make an effort, you know. And so for a few gigs, he quit after each gigs <laughs> until I finally took care of the business, you know. <laughs> It was such a great lesson. Oh God, wow. I mean, I'm, so, I'm so thankful to this day, you know. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> That's really wonderful. I love him. <laughs> yeah. yeah, me too. <laughs> Is he still around? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he doesn't play very much anymore, but he's still around, still collecting toy trains. And uh, it's interesting. A lot of drummers seem to do that. You know what? I know somebody who does that too, Brad Dudes, who's a percussionist and drummer. And yeah. he has huge, like a huge train, two train sets, three train sets or something. Right. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, there's an older drummer here, Leon Bodash, who was his, his model actually, who really helped me when I was starting. He, he was a dear friend of my parents and we would go on vacation with them in Italy with him and his wife. And he would bring his brushes and a, a newspaper and we would play in duo, you know, every day during the vacation. It was great. And this guy toured all over Europe with uh, Don Bias and Coleman Hawkins and people like that, you know, and he was also a big train collector. So there's something about drummers and toy trains. <laughs> Interesting. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, of course, I would be remiss not mentioning Judy because, uh, you know, I've learned so much playing, uh, writing arrangements, and sorry, uh, it's Judy producing Nemec with her. Talking. Yeah, Judy Nemac. Yeah, right. Judy Nemac. She's, um, she's a great singer. And uh, she's incredible. Singer she's and... she's one of the real masters of this art form. And, she really uh, is a musician. <laughs> oh, yeah, she truly is. She she leads the band like, you know, better than, than most tenor, tenor players I know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and um, it's for me, it's it's really with with people like her, but of course with her because we we worked together for so long and uh, we were together, we were married together for a long time, and so I've learned so much from her, but also from other great vocalists that I've worked with, of course. But with her, in the long term, I mean, we 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 spend so much time working on music together and developing our musical message together, you know. Yeah, and it's about it's really about telling a story and uh, as an accompanist it's so important that you realize the whole global thing and not just that you're playing a beautiful voicing or or that uh, your time is killing or something like that but you have to realize what the others are doing and especially what the what the melody person is doing whether it's a vocalist or, or a solo instrumentalist and to to never be redundant with anything, you know, to really leave the space for everything. And sometimes if you don't play, it's better than if you do, you know, and uh, it's I've learned so much about that. And then, you know, the way she deals with words really taught me a lot. And uh, I, I really got into words. And when I when I teach my guitar players for years now, if they want to learn standards, they have to learn the, sta the, the, the words to the standards too, if, uh, or any song actually. If it's a yeah, song, yeah. you should know what the song is about, especially if you're going to do an arrangement or something. You shouldn't do an arrangement that clashes with, with the words, you know, or the meaning of the song. Yeah. Yeah, that's so true. God, I have this one, I won't, I won't thoroughly say who it is or what the song is, but <clears throat> there's a singer. I love the singer. I love her project. 
But she did this one song. It's an old pop song, pop, I guess, acoustic rock. It's like an old, mm -hmm. you know, uh, older from from 30 years ago or something, and uh, or 40 years ago probably. And to me, the song is ki like emotionally killing. You know, mm -hmm. it's like oh, you know, that kind of a song, and. The producer chose to do it as a bossa nova and a very like kind of you know uh, more happy you know and I was just when I heard it I was like what that mm -hmm. couldn't possibly be that <laughs> right right they didn't do that with that song tell me they didn't do that with that song <laughs> <clears throat> and yeah. they did and yeah. I was really bummed out over it because I really loved the record I love her singing loved the production on the whole thing the musicians everything but that was such a weird choice I just I couldn't I couldn't deal with that you know what song uh, a friend of mine almost he was doing um, what's new as mm -hmm. a swing tune oh like, I'm sorry no <laughs> no because it's it's a it's subtle and it's like it's a killing song you right. know it's like wow man you can't do that no no <laughs> no, 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 you know, actually, there's one version that is at the, at the limit of something that I would never imagine, and it worked so well of that song, which I love. Uh, I there's a nice video where I played with with another one of my mentors, John Rocco, one of the world's greatest clarinet players, great tenor player. Anyway, I'm sure you you know and love that recording. It's the live recording of of Carmen McRae with Betty Carter. Oh yeah, and they do it as a waltz. What's new? Do they? Yeah. Oh, I, you know, I'll have to go back and listen. To like that. a medium, yeah. medium tempo waltz, you know. And I would imagine if somebody told me that, I would go like, "Come on, man, no." Yeah. But then that version is so great. Wow. And uh, it's a great band, you know. It's it's Kenny Washington on drums and James Whiteman on piano, and you know, it's it's wonderful. That's a really or, fun record. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great record. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I definitely things can can change. And you can change your take on them. Like, what was that? Uh, remember that kind of dark piano player singer from Chicago, a woman. And for a while, about twenty years ago, she was she was kind of gaining popularity. Uh, I can't remember her name, but she would take songs and do them dark with these different kind of rhythmic mm -hmm. interpretations. And it worked because obviously that was <laughs> that was where she lived, you know. Right. <clears throat> so it did work. Um, yeah, I mean, some some versions are so shocking that they become like like a new a new thing, you know. Like, uh, the, I guess the first time people heard the version of Laura by uh, Gene Lee and and Ren Blake, they must have been shocked, you know. I don't know that version. Oh, it's beautiful. Oh, it's fantastic. I'll have to write that down and check it out. <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm about to write down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. On one of my 3,000 lists. Okay, so, uh, oh, I didn't know that. And um, let's see. I don't want to use that list. <laughs> okay, so I'm writing down Laura by Rand Blake. And who? Jean Lee. Oh. Or do you say Jeannie? Jeannie Lee? Uh, I, I've heard both. Yeah. Okay, okay I'm going to have to listen to that. She was what, great. What is it like? Very dark. Ah. And, and Rand Blake has a kind of contemporary classical approach to changes, you know. And, but it works. It's really beautiful. Really beautiful. But she, her voice is so warm, you know. It's It's really... It's a nice contrast between the two. It's, it's really cool. Oh, I'm gonna. Oh, thanks, Dan. Dan put up. He uh, <clears throat> posted the uh, Carmen McRae and Betty Carter version of what's. Oh, there you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you. Um, uh, sorry, if you knew. Oh yeah. Do 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 you ever come across David Links? Yes, sure. He's a friend. Yeah, I just, you know, I had interviewed him and, um, but I just listened to the Bald James Baldwin thing. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 
That is so frigging gorgeous. I could listen to that every day for three weeks, I'm sure. Yeah, I'd yeah. never be tired of it. That that was very magnificent project. Yeah. But he was a friend of his, huh? I mean, they really knew each other. So for him, it, it was really extremely important to do that project. And uh, yeah, Dave is great. Actually, you know what what I did do? I didn't I didn't pick up the record store, but I picked up the label that my parents had started here many oh. years ago. Oh. And so uh, I'm about to release in a few months uh, an album of Belgian all stars performing in uh, in a festival here in Belgium, and David is on there singing a couple songs with us, and uh, it's really yeah. nice. Yeah, he's great. I like him. Yeah, the story of the James Baldwin story is really interesting. I don't know if you know this part, but so he read when he was growing up, he, it was like his obsession to read everything that, da that James Baldwin had written. Right. And then he, um, there was a, an event when he was a little older, in like in high school or something, I think it was, there was an event where James Baldwin, Baldwin was speaking and he and James and his brother were there and um, David went <laughs> and afterwards like literally sat down on the couch next to him and told him that he knew everything that he had ever written and uh -huh. they got they got to be friends and I think it was right then that James said well if you ever want to come stay with me you're invited and he lived in France and I th it was like the next year, David actually showed up at his doorstep with his suitcase and stayed with him for, I think, several years. Amazing. Yeah. That's pretty, a great story. Uh, pretty, pretty wild story. Yeah. 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 I mean, this is the way it happens yeah. for, for a lot of people. You know, when when you're when you have such a passion for something and you get to meet your heroes. Yeah. You know, that, that's how I met Toots. And also, you know, I, the first time I met him, I sang some of his solos back to him, you know, and things like that. And he was so floored. He was like, okay, we have to talk, you know, <laughs> let's meet again. How old and, were you? Uh, um, I think I was 21, 22, something like that. Yeah. I, um, I started playing when I was 18, you know, I started playing very late. And, uh, but I knew so much music already organically from having listened to it thoroughly that it just needed to come out, you know, and and, uh, and then I was I was doing a lot of different styles of music with different people. There was a, a jam session that I was going to every Monday. It was kind of avant-garde. And uh, the bass player there was Michel Adzi Giorgio, who's the guy from that great band now that, that just celebrated their 30th anniversary called Akamoon which is this really avant-garde band, you know, uh, they called themselves Akamun because they, they went and lived with the Aka Pygmies for three months to study their music. Wow. It's a fantastic band. And uh, Michel Adi Giorgio uh, played a lot with Toots. Toots met him because he was the one and only real student of Jacob Astorius's. Oh. Fantastic electric bass player. And uh, Michel was playing there in that session and, and every Monday we were playing there and then an, we met in another session which was in another club where it was more traditional and we played standards and then all of a sudden they started playing Velas that Toots had recorded you know the the, the Ivan Lins tune and I played it with him by ear and he was floored you know because I had listened to it so many times you know I, I couldn't read or, or write notes then and wow. uh, and so Michelle told me, okay, we're playing in Waterloo next week with Toots. You should come. And I said, I'm planning to come anyway. I love Toots, you know, so, okay, great. And so he introduced me to Toots. He said, Toots, you should listen to this guy. And uh, that's how we met. Wow. And then, <clears throat> so then did you, you started playing with him or? Yeah, I mean, he invited me over to his house and we, we immediately started playing together at his house. And then every time I had a gig in Belgium and he was, he was here, he would come and sit in huh. and, and he would do the same with me. Of course, I wanted to hear every one of his concerts here. And every time he would invite me to go on stage and play on his guitar, which was very convenient because his guitar was already set up for him to play, you know. And uh, I mean, he was so generous. It was incredible. And then uh, I produced some recordings with him and 
I uh, I brought him to to uh, Judy Judy Niemack's album Straight Up, on which he recorded, and then introduced him to Kenny Werner there, and so that's how Kenny became his pianist for the, the last 15 years of his life or something. And, I didn't uh, even know that actually. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I, I introduced them. I was really happy about that. That's wild. Yeah, yeah. I didn't. I didn't. The first time I heard Kenny Werner, I was in Japan and uh, traveling with my piano player, and we were in the car traveling, and he said, oh, listen to this, and that was it, Kenny Werner. I was like, oh my God, I'm a fan. So oh, yeah. I, had, I strangely had no idea that he he uh, played with Tuss for 15 years. Wow, that's a, yeah. that's a long time. That's significant. I should have known that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They had a very special thing. I played a, a lot in duo and then with rhythm sections and also with some of the Brazilians, you know, that Toots did this amazing Brazil project, you know, the two volumes. And uh, I got to meet all those people thanks to him. That was so amazing. That was an incredible project. Oh my God. Blue Z was like mind blowing. Yeah, yeah. Totally yeah. mind blowing. Yeah, incredible. Can you imagine? <laughs> I don't know if you were there, but. <laughs> The session must have been so much friggin' fun. <laughs> I was not there. I was not there, but I, I Toots gave me all the uh, all the recordings on cassettes before they added all the other instruments. Because what they did is that they recorded with all these great singers, yeah. just with Oscar Castro Neves on guitar, and sometimes some of the the singers on guitar themselves also or on piano, like Ivan Lins, yeah. and Toots, and then all the strings, all the other, you know little accoutrements were, were added later. But um, I have these these gems, you know, these things that are just totally pure, just the voice and the and the guitar and the, the uh, harmonica, you know, it's just killing. Oh my God. Yeah. And uh, of course it's Brazil. So Toots told me, you know, the, the session was supposed to start at 10.30. So I would be there at 10.15. And then the first guy who would show up was the sound engineer and it was 1.30 in the afternoon, you know. <laughs> Brazil, Italy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But wow. uh, somehow they, they managed to do all the mag magic. God, that must have been. That, oh my God, that would be a really great thing to hear. The, yeah. the, the um, basic tracks. You know, um, actually, um, the. <clears throat> oh God, my brain isn't working, but. Oh God. Okay, hold on. Let me Let me have a minute to think about this. <laughs> Joao, um, when he did that orchestral record with the famous arranger. Klaus Augerman. Yes. Yeah. So when he did uh, Amoroso. Yes, 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 that album. And, and <clears throat> it was kind of mind blowing because his time, mm. where he plays, is <laughs> is never on one, right? And so it's. Well, like, the killing thing is that he plays his groove doesn't move he's so in the pocket yeah the way he sings he's totally floating on top of that you know it's like he has two brains this guy it's totally. incredible and and the the orchestra let's see yeah the orchestra the orchestra i'm pretty sure the orchestra was added later because i knew uh -huh. the drummer, and he told me that and um that we, and that's an another amazing kind of a thing you know that's an achievement yeah <laughs> it's just wow man i mean i know people do you know all kinds of things and end up with incredible stuff but it's kind of mind-blowing when you hear it, when you hear it <laughs> right right you don't think about it you know yeah i'm a total ogre band fan i mean the guy is a brilliant genius yeah gorgeous yeah it's funny because i have a whole bunch of records my husband has thousands of records i don't know if you remember that but um so I've been going through records, um, and I actually got a lot from Roland, who's on on Facebook right now. And um, so I've been going through them inch by inch, and you know, seeing what I have and why. And mm -hmm. there were there are some things that I'm like, where did I get this one? I don't think Roland had it. Like <laughs> this morning, there was a uh, um, a guy who played. Um, oh, jeez, God, this is one of those days when I don't have my words. Um, <clears throat> I have a lot of those too. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> it takes me a minute. Anyway, it was an accordion player, and it was horrible. The record was like, why did I get this record? I'm not sure. Even from Roland, I <laughs> right, Roland, because I picked, I hand picked. But um, anyway, I did have a Michelle Legrand record where he was 
he was doing all music that related to Paris or mm -hmm. France. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was like, oh, yeah. It was really, oh, yeah. Because it was a nice, you know, Michelle Legrand. Yeah. So that's, you You hear stuff sometimes that is is really good. And <laughs> who knows how that was created, you know? Yeah. That's um, another guy I met through Toots, Michelle. Yeah. 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 I mean, Toots knew everybody. You know, there was there was this uh, crazy party for his 70th birthday. Um, his drummer, who's one of my dearest friends, Bruno Castellucci, organized a surprise birthday party for Toots. Um, How do you do that, man? <laughs> for his 70th. Wow. And so he put together an, uh, an all-star European big band that was, was so fortunate to play in the band. And so I mean, the guests were ridiculous. There was there was Michel Legrand. There was this other star from France, Henri Salvador. Sacha Distel was there. Uh, you know, all those people came to sing, and Quincy came to conduct us. Oh my God! Quincy flew from LA for three days to be there to conduct us. You know, and uh, it was all a surprise. You know, it's so amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. Toots must have been pretty blown away by that oh he was blown away but he played his ass off anyway he came on stage as if he had rehearsed with everybody <laughs> and just did the thing you know it's just like oh incredible yeah. yeah sometime I'd like to really look at his story you know of coming up I don't, I've never I've never done that yeah he has a very interesting story I mean uh, he was he was from a very from a very poor neighborhood here in Brussels uh, his parents had a cafe and he grew up playing the accordion, actually. Huh. Yeah. Man, when he was three, he was playing. He was entertaining the customers, apparently. Do you know who, who grew up playing accordion for years and went to college for it? Janice Borla. That's true. I had forgotten that detail. That's yeah, right. That's right. I guess and that's where we met the first time, right? Was Janice's workshop. I think so. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, she came up in it because it was a Polish, right? You know, tradition. Tradition, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but when she told me that, I was like, "Oh my God! Wow, incredible!" And she went to college for it. I mean, she. she yeah, yeah. Must have played. Oh, I think she know. was. She was really excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Um, huh. I, I have a, I have a list of. You know, I have your your um, your bio, which I put up on the show as well. Um, played with so many people, and uh, you have. Do you is this like a current list? Seven CDs as a leader. Yeah, I just recorded the new one. Oh. Um, I went to New York and recorded at Rudy Van Gelder's, and uh, that's, that's cool. really exciting. Yeah. A very exciting band. Who is it? Okay, uh, so <laughs> it's uh, it's basically a quartet, and we have a couple guests on a couple of tunes. So the quartet is um, Danny Grisette on piano. You know Danny? I know his name. Yeah, he's an incredible pianist, uh, originally from from uh, the West Coast, and um, I think he's been in New York for a while, but he's he's in Vienna now for twelve years, oh. and. Um, He's been in Tom Harrell's band for many years and Benny Golson and people like that. He's an incredible accompanist, but he also has a lot of his own, own trio projects. You know, he's, he's a great composer and a beautiful musician. And we had played a few times, never in Vienna or in Brussels, but uh, uh, craziest places. Like we met in Slovenia, we were teaching a workshop there and played the concert there. And we played in Buenos Aires. You know, they put us together in the festival in Buenos Aires. I was I was working there with Judy, and he was working there with Tom Harrell, and they put us together to do a quartet with a local rhythm section. It was great, you know. And so I always wanted to do something with him. Yeah. And my dear friend Jay Anderson on bass, yeah, who yeah. I know you know. Yeah. And um, a great drummer, E.J. Strickland, yeah. who. Uh, He's a beautiful drummer, very interesting composer as well. And his, uh, his twin bro brother is a, is a really good tenor player also, Marcus Strickland. You know, oh, they're, they're another beautiful musicians. Cool. Yeah. Like the, Farber, the Ferber, bro Ferber brothers. 
right 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 of them right yeah, yeah. and um, so that's the quartet and um, another friend who I hadn't been working with him for a while but he's, he's one of my favorite saxophone players uh, Jalil Shaw you know Jalil uh, alto player he was in Roy Haynes's band for a long time and uh, you see him all over the place right now he has this great pure it's very personal his tone it's how do you how do you spell his first name Jalil it's J A L E E L okay Shaw and um Jeremy Pelt on trumpet oh yeah so it's very really nice so when will that maybe be coming out I hope before the end of the year I still have some work to do I haven't chosen the, the takes or uh, mixed or anything like that and uh, I will do the work here in Europe you know I'm a sound engineer I graduated as a as a sound engineer before I officially studied music so uh, wow. that helps me as a, as a producer and also as a recording musician you know it's it's good to know how it works yeah it's very good yeah I'm just uh, <clears throat> I'm getting into logic a little more you know and but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm pretty uh, immature in my education <laughs> let me put it that way <laughs> well a lot of it with these great softwares a lot of it you can you can learn while doing it yeah. And uh, they're so good now. I mean, I started with Pro Tools on the computer, but first, you know, when we studied, we were doing it with the with the real soundboards and everything like that, which helps me understand all the technology when it goes digital, of course. But it's very intuitive the the way they build those things now. I mean, there's still a lot of things that you have to know, of course, you know. Yeah, there's little uh, kind of behind the scene tricks and. Yeah. I mean, when you talk to people, they tell you little tricks. And I have been in the studio enough that I, you know, I I know what it looks like. And I know I know a lot of the the things that I use that I need. So sure, of course, that's the other thing. You know, I don't need to learn all of logic before I start. I can just go ahead and do what I do what I need. Right. Uh, and so. That's but it's I really interesting, it. you know, it has started that, that Pro Tools was only for acoustic music and yeah. Logic was only for electronic music. Yeah. And they both developed so much that they both work very well for, for both fields now. And so it still seems like for some countries in Europe, like uh, Germany and uh, other places, they, they work more with Logic and in the States more with Pro Tools. But uh, I work with both now. It's fun. There's one of the albums that I recorded on, on my label um, from Maria Palatine. The whole al uh, album was recorded on Pro to uh, on Logic. And then some other things I recorded on Pro Tools, you know, it's just yeah, depends. Yeah. yeah. So um, you are busy uh, producing or, or slash recording other people too? Yeah, I don't do much of the recording. I do sometimes. Like that album I recorded entirely. Um, but what I very often do now is, is uh, some mix or mastering or remastering of products. You know, like um, I, uh, I remastered uh, another album that I, that I just put out on my label, which is from the, the Berlin Jazz Orchestra that I've been playing with since the beginning. So it's almost 22 years now. Oh, wow. And uh, we recorded a whole album about Berlin. And... Uh, I liked the, the the sound engineer was really excellent. He has a lot of experience with um, with big bands, and I liked his mix. But the master wasn't uh, exciting enough for me, so I, I spent a little time on there and remastered it and uh, things like that, you know. Well, let me ask you something because I I don't know if I've I, I don't think I've ever talked about this on this show, but <clears throat> I think people are interested in this kind of stuff because they. Some people have no idea, and some people want to know. So right. <clears throat> the, there's the mix, and then there's the mastering. Right. And um, so the mix, would you say the mix is a, is kind of, I, obviously it's the first kind of blending of sounds and like how, how loud you want the piano or mm -hmm. that kind of thing, right? Or um, it's not editing, because editing is 
before that, and that's like, well, let's move this over or tune this or take this out, right. uh, that kind of thing. And then there's the mix, which is how is it all <clears throat> balanced and stuff. So what what's the difference between the mix and the master? I mean, my, my understanding is that the mastering uh, might <clears throat> bring more of the sound. It's, it's kind of basically about the sound, but sometimes I am confused, I admit, on what can the mastering do? Can the mastering do, do like make the vocal louder? Or I don't think so, right? Or it's, it, that's for the mix. Well, <laughs> actually, now uh, I, I just I just got a whole suite of, of uh, new um, post production software, which allows you to change the volume of several things after it was mixed. But that's kind of new technology. Um, if I if I can make an analogy with with food, uh, editing is, is is clearly cutting all the stuff at the right size so that it all fits together. Uh, mixing is making the perfect soup. And mastering is when you have a five course meal and you want it to all work together and be perfect from beginning till end, <laughs> you know? And so um, in the mix, you, you want to make sure that there's, there's enough salt, but not too much. And uh, that, uh, that you can still get the really the really subtle uh, plum tomato that you have in there even after you put the cilantro. But uh, so that's the mix. And then the mastering, first of all, first of all, you want to make sure, especially when we're still making albums, because I still make CDs, I still press CDs for my label. It's still important for me because there's still a bunch of people. It's funny, some people don't even have a player anymore, but they still buy the CD because they will listen to it on Spotify, but they want to have the object and read the liner notes and see the photos and see, you know, the thing. They, they still want to attach it to something physical, which I'm one of those people too. And so when you make an album, you want it to be homogenous from the beginning until the end. Of course, there will be dynamics, there will be surprises and things like that, but there shouldn't be one track that is much softer than the others or at least not much softer than the one before and the one after, because then it's a shock if you're listening to it, you know, unless that's strategic and that's something that you really want to achieve, you know. But these are the details that you can really work with at the mastering. And um, you can also work on how, you know, if you can add a little bit of shine on the whole thing, you can, you can um, make it a little more um bright or or make it a little more orchestral sounding there are little things little tools that you can use at the mastering level that you cannot do yet when when you're still just mixing because you don't want to go too extreme with the mix the mix has to work and be nice sounding and everything like that but all those extreme measures you can take at the mastering does, does that sound like anything is that clear oh. Yeah, that's kind of what I imagined. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, the like uh, there's there's a mastering guy that I like a lot, especially for vocal stuff. And he's a vocal. He happens to be a vocalist. And um, and I've been over to his studio, and it's like, <laughs> I mean, if if it always sounded like that, it would be amazing, you know. Um, which it's funny because re. Um, <laughs> I guess I don't know. I have I have set up in my uh, area here with um, a, a louder bass. Uh, uh, I forget the word again. You know, separate bass. Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see what you mean. Turn yeah. up a little, and I guess I I guess it's a little heavy because I always tell this one engineer I do a lot of work with him. And I always tell tell him that it's a little bass heavy. <laughs> Even when I turn down my bass, it seems it seems that he likes. He's a guitar player too, so I don't know. Maybe he hears a, the string. I have to go over to his studio to hear, you know. Mm. But even that, I mean, in the old days, they used to say, "Take a CD into your car, right?" Right. And just listen everywhere that you can. 
<clears throat> um, so I do that. My my father passed away a couple of years ago, and I inherited this car. And uh, there's still a CD player in there, so I go and listen to the mixes in there. That's for sure. It's interesting, isn't it? And and yeah. also, I guess there's small smaller speakers that you can hear everything on. Bigger speakers. Some engineers like to hear the mix at a lower volume, which. I understand, but I actually like to hear it about here. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. But it's good to, to do both, actually. Yeah. And uh, if you listen to it very softly and something is totally gone, then it's not good. It's not right, you know. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, it's such a such an individual taste thing also. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we all hear different things also. In function of how we feel today, you know. Yeah. Um, one thing that I always tell people who don't have much experience mixing, if they go into a mixing session or something, is bring something that is a real reference for you. So a recording that you've listened to millions of times at home, and you know how it sounds at home, and listen to it on the system where you're going to be mixing in the studio. So you can hear how that recording sounds, and you can compare your own recording to that you know it's important to have references that's really good information i've heard that before but um but talking about it now thank you for that that's yeah that's, sure that is good information because it takes a little bit of the um, um uh, uh the vagueness you know out of it yeah you know? I mean, you don't know the speakers, you don't know you, you don't know the sound system you're listening to, yeah. so how can you how can you say that this is exactly the mix you want? You know, then it sounds great in the studio, and you bring it back home, and it sounds terrible. That's not at all what you wanted, you know. So, yeah, yeah. that's cool. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, sure. Um, I want to hear some more of Jean Francois Prince. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm going to my list. I also made a playlist if there's something you want to hear. Okay. Well, let's see. I have. Oh. Um, yeah, I mean, I have your list that you sent me. Okay. If you have a playlist, you can tell me. Well, you can't tell me which one because it, they're just YouTube links that I have. Ah, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, those videos, right. I, I mean, there's videos, but there's, of course, a lot of, a lot of audio, too, that we can listen to. But uh, which video did you have in mind? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, what about the second one down? <laughs> I don't know which one that is. Uh, <laughs> I know you probably don't see. Let's let's just see what it is. Okay. Cool. Oh, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. A hot night driving to the city. Stop light. The view from my here is pretty. It's alright. I'm gonna take a look. Thank you. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A long time ago, right? 92. Yeah. Super young. Yeah, that's right. Time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> tell, me, tell us about um, Lee Konitz. Oh, Lee. He was a real poet. You know, he was, he was um, an extremely difficult character for most people. But um, he was so nice to me. I mean, I remember a conversation I had with Kenny Werner once where this is when I was starting to really work with Lee. And I told him, I feel like such an imposter. You know, what am I doing playing with Lee Konitz? He's such a giant, you know, and I'm there and I've... And so Kenny said, so you don't respect Lee, huh? I said, yes, of course. What are you saying? What are you talking about? And he says, well, Lee chose you. He wants you to play with him. That means something. He sees something in you that you don't see yet. So go for it. Do your best work as hard as possible and just go and play with, with him. You know, that's what he wants. <laughs> you know, wild. yeah. And Lee, um, I think the first three or four tours we did together, long tours, he wouldn't call one tune. He would just start improvising freely and we would have to guess what tune he was playing, you know, and uh, it was not a trick. It was not trying to trap us because he wanted everybody else in the band to do the same, even the drummer. And uh, what it did was that it forced everybody to listen all the time. Everybody was on the ball at every moment. You know, and it was so exciting. I mean, I remember the the, the excitement. I, I mean, the, the concert was ended and we couldn't sleep for hours after that, you know, because it, <laughs> we were so high on energy, you know. Yeah. And um, at one time, Bruno, the drummer you just heard there, uh, who was Tutsu's drummer too, we were, we were touring with Bruno and, and Bruno started an intro 
and the bass player and I immediately understood that he was playing Green Dolphin Street. So we started it with him. And Lee was really angry afterwards and he said, uh, so did you guys talk about it in advance? Did you plan that? <laughs> I said, no, Lee, he did his intro and we heard what it was. I said, shit, I missed it. He <laughs> 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 was so pure, you know? And um, he was he was such an incredible musician. I mean, um, Toots had a lot of respect for him and, and he loved Toots too, but they never dared to do stuff together because they thought they were for, for too much from different worlds, you know? And uh, I, I'm very proud that I got them to play together and also to record together. Yeah. And uh, that was really something, an achievement for me, you know, my two mentors who did something together. And uh, I would like to, to play a tune that I wrote for Lee. Um, I, I did an album many years ago with my trio in New York with, with Mike Richmond and Adam Nussbaum. And I had asked Lee to be my guest on a few tunes. You know, I had left a message on his answering machine and he never called me back. So I thought, okay, either he can't or he doesn't want to do it. You know, that's fine. And then two days before the recording, he called me and he said, hey, man, I'm just back in town. I'll do it. Great. I didn't have any music for him, <laughs> you know. So finally, he recorded a standard with me um, along together and two tunes that I wrote for him within those two days. And so he sight read the music in, in the studio. We recorded the whole album in five hours and um, he this tune, I was really imagining his sound for this tune that I called Fifth Avenue. And uh, what's on the album is the first take. You know, he, he sight read it and he played it as if he wrote it. And his solo was so perfect that actually um, somebody, a pianist, Vincent Brunings, wrote a big band arrangement on it recently. That's one of the videos I sent you. And he used Lee's solo and uh, orchestralized it for the whole big band. You know, it's really nice. Wow. It starts with one alto saxophone and then the saxophone section and then finally all the horns, you know. Wow. And uh, his solo is so beautiful. I'll play you a little bit of that. Okay. So this is an album that is actually not findable right now, um, but that um, I will re-release on my label. It's my album called um, All Around Town, which is a, a whole album dedicated to the city of New York. And uh, this is a tune called Fifth Avenue. Mm -hmm.
sure I want to play some more stuff for you. <laughs> <laughs> Taking away your solo, man. Yes. Was that the so th was that the solo that the big band arrangement was written yeah. from? That must be gorgeous. I'm yeah, it's really nice. Looking for that on my list. Yeah, it's one of the videos. Um, yeah, I mean Lee. Lee has been an influence on so many levels, you know, and and um, he was such a great leader too. Like really taking care of his people. I remember we were playing at um, just details like that, you know. We we actually recorded the only album ever recorded at Euro Disney. Mm you know, uh, with my trio and him. And um, the first time we went there, the guy from the club, it was a very good club and a lot of people came from Paris to listen to the music there. And uh, he came to him and he said, uh, well, as the leader, here's here is a ticket to go to the, the, the park, you know, to the Disney park. And Lee said, well, what about the rest of the band? And he said, no, that's just for the leader. And Lee said, okay, I don't want it. Here you go. <laughs> and the guy was so, you know, um, ashamed by that, that he got tickets for everybody. So the next day we were all taking all the rides with Lee, you know, he was laughing like a little boy on all, the, all, the, all those things. He was having such a great time. But he, he thought that was not fair at all, you know, and he was, he was the visiting American superstar playing with a local band, but he didn't see it like that, you know, and I really appreciated that. He was a very generous guy, and um, it's actually one of the reasons I think that uh, that's what came from our talking about it together. That's why he left the, the Tristano school, because first of all, he was ready to go on and, and do his own thing, but also he felt like he wasn't authorized to really interact with the rhythm section mm. there. and. Um, by the end of his life, if the band was not interacting with him, he couldn't play. He sounded terrible, even when he was in great shape. Because for him, it was really important that everybody plays ping pong with each other all the time, you know? Yeah. And then he, he was out of this world. He was so beautiful, what he could do out of what, what you would give him, you know? His tone, I mean, immediately I think of Joe Lovano. He must have, yeah. you know, must have absorbed um abs absorbed lee right yeah yeah well joe has the whole tradition and, and then and then his own incredible beauty with it you know i mean joe is one of the first people i've i've learned with uh i, I took a workshop with him when i was just starting to play hmm. and uh, he's been a friend ever since for more than 30 years and uh he's been such an inspiration it's so nice. I, I just took a trip back east and did a few gigs and um, hung out with Jay Clayton in New York. Yeah, and yeah, Jay. And stuff. But um, I also played at the Deerhead. And on my way from New York to the Deerhead, we st we were going to stay with Judy and Joe, but they got COVID. <laughs> oh, no. So um, we but we went and visited them in their, mm. you know, we hung out in their yard. Wow, nice. Great. Beautiful yard, yeah. Yeah, with that sculpting of palm ocean. <laughs> anyway, I really like. I, I think both of them are so cool. Not to they're wonderful. Them. Judy's such a such a beautiful person and uh, artist, and uh, I love her painting too. And yeah. uh, she's really great. Yeah, yeah. beautiful people. Um, I um, <clears throat> I have a friend here, Taylor Hatch, who's a guitarist, and he's studying at North Texas. Mm -hmm. And um, he has a few guitar questions for you. Okay, <laughs> let's go. Um, does practicing counterpoint, uh, like two note movement on the guitar become an area practice that you focus on a lot? Um, sometimes, you know, it's, it's, it's a thing when, when, uh, when you're dealing with, with uh, real life, you have to, you have to kind of um, use the time you have for what you need at the moment you have the time <laughs> you know yeah, yeah, and so yeah. uh, I find myself practicing a lot of things that relate to the gigs that I have 
So if I know I'm going to play a certain type of music or uh, with a certain type of group or something, I will choose what kind of things I want to practice then. Yeah. And um, but there was a there was an amazing guitarist on the West Coast who I met through Potter Smith. Uh, his name was Jimmy Weibel. And uh, he wrote books about uh, counterpoint on the guitar, which were incredible. And he gave them to me. I got to meet him thanks to Putter. And he gave me a whole bunch of exercises that were not in his books also. And uh, this is definitely something that is interesting for me, um, but that I don't always get to practice as much as I would like to. Also, I have two very young kids, and that takes a lot of time too. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. Yeah been a while um, yeah <laughs> uh yeah jimmy weibel i mean he was the hero here you know he was in incredible our community Phew. yeah totally and actually larry coons studied with him a lot yeah larry's great actually we we recorded a beautiful album with putter a few years back that didn't get re released because the label that was supposed to put it out folded and so I'm going to release it this year or, or early next year. And uh, there's a couple tunes by Larry's on there. Great compositions. Which ones? Um, one is called is uh, Candle. Candle. Yeah. 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 Oh, I love Candle. Yeah, a lot of people love Candle. I, and, he, he played the other Saturday night and he played Candle and he also oh, yeah? played um, Blues for Albert E. That's another popular one across Wait, the let world. Wait, me, let me see. Let me see. And then which he one. wrote, which one? Did he write Candle for Weibel? There was one, a song he wrote for Jimmy. I'm not sure, but it's possible. It's a beautiful song. Oh, it's I incredible. Yeah. We did a nice, a nice version with Putter. Oh, um, my friend Rowan wants to know if your label is findable. Can he buy stuff from it? Um, how does he do that? First, the title of the other tune is Astarte. 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 It's a beautiful kind of uh, samba tune that you wrote. Oh. My label is findable, um, and uh, you can you can purchase stuff through Bandcamp. Okay, Bandcamp. Uh, the label is called Gam Records, G A M, okay. and the, la the 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 website of the label is G A M minus music, gammusic.com. Gam, say that again. <laughs> so G A M and then the minus sign. Yeah. Music. Oh, dot com. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you can buy from from Bandcamp. You can buy it from Bandcamp. That's if you want to buy it directly from my label. You can also find it on different places like uh, Amazon, Apple, all those different, you know, okay. platforms. Yeah. It's all it's all it's on the major platforms and it's also findable on YouTube and everything. Yeah. And, Spotify and uh... you know I have this weird Facebook thing that's happening community standards and I can't post on my own show oh, that's <laughs> it's tiring. weird community standards if anyone knows about that help me but anyway can you guys somebody write gam dash music dot com okay so do that for me because Apparently, I can't. <laughs> I have to find out about that. I don't know what the heck. I'll, I'll have to ask my my brilliant um, computer guy, community standards, because he he probably can find it for some reason. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. I, you know, I have a high tolerance level, but <laughs> when stuff like that happens, I just my I feel the top of my head kind of frying. I totally understand. It's so frustrating because it's your own page, right? And you don't get yeah. to you don't get to post on it. Yeah, yeah what's really with community standards? I, yeah. I, it's mine. It's your community. <laughs> you know? I'm not swearing or anything, you know. Um, let's see. And Taylor at North Texas, it's encouraged for guitarists to write their own etudes. Okay. Uh, is that helpful for you? Have you done that, or do you do that, or have you done it? No, I haven't done etudes. What I've done is is writing. Um, I didn't write solos, but I wrote new melodies on chord changes. So, uh, what the beboppers did, you know, what what uh, 
Bird and all those guys did and the Tristano School and everything. I did a few of those, some of which I've decided to keep in my repertoire and record and uh, I can play you one. Um, okay. This is a line that I wrote on uh, what is this thing called love. But it's kind of hard to re to hear from the from the way we we played it because we play it in four, but there's a there's an ostinato in bass in three under it. Okay. And so this is from my recording El Gaucho. This is with um, Rich Perry on tenor sax, uh, Yuri Stepe on bass, and uh, Victor Lewis on drums. It's called Wet. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank you. 
cetera. <laughs> cool. So yeah, it, just uh, this is kind of a silly question, but uh, what style of music do you call that? Do you call that modern jazz? Do you call it straight ahead? What do you do? You have a term modern term? mainstream, I would call it. Modern mainstream. Yeah. Okay. So it's still very much based in the tradition. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but it's modern. Yeah. Yeah. I was just curious mm -hmm. because sometimes when people ask me, you know, like what I do or what I heard, you know, I tend towards the word modern jazz, but yeah, uh, yeah, just curious. Yeah, I mean, modern is such a such an often used word. You know, it's something. I mean, what people recorded in the mid '40s is modern jazz too. Yeah. And then how do you make the difference? You know, exactly. It's so complicated. Uh, it's hard to it's hard to reduce it to one word. <laughs> right, and it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter, although it's it's nice to be able to to put some kind of formula that describes what you do to give it to people who have no idea, you know. And and I'm very interested in in what people think when they listen to to my music, and they don't know what what jazz is or anything like that and and a lot of people when i when i play concerts i play in this club here in brussels which is called the music village which is a beautiful club where a lot of real jazz lovers go but also a lot of tourists because it's right next to the central marketplace which is supposed to be the most beautiful one in the world right the, the grand place of brussels it's really beautiful and so a lot of people come just because they're in the city and they come and listen to the music and they're blown away. You know, they're like, what the hell is that you're playing there? You know, I love it, but I don't know why. And I tell them when well, I'm really happy, you love it. I don't care why, <laughs> you know, <laughs> tell me what you liked about it, because I prefer people who have feelings for the music they're listening to than people who understand everything in their head and can describe it and everything like that, but they don't have a feeling for it. You know what I mean? It's more interesting for me to to reach people on a on a more organic level, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Sometimes I find, like, when I'm listening to to some music, um, how do I put this? Uh, sometimes, if I'm just, if I'm a little removed from listening specifically to to a player, uh, like especially the soloist. I might actually not lo love the, the piece, but then when I focus in on the player, what the player is doing, I'm drawn in. Uh -huh. And uh, I think a lot of people, I mean, obviously fans of the music can do that, but people who aren't particularly fans, you know, that may not be what they're, what they're doing. You know, they may be mm -hmm. kind of doing the other one, which is kind of listening to the broad, Right. A lot of fact, you know. Right. But I think <clears throat> it's so important to to hear jazz live. Yeah. Because you get the energy, you get the interaction be between the players when you actually witness it happening. You know, when you listen to a recording, it's really hard to understand what's going on. And uh, me personally, it took me a while to understand some people that, that I ended up loving, you know. Yeah. I knew that Ornette Coleman was great, but I didn't understand why for the longest time until I saw him live. There was this great concert in Brussels where he played with his quartet with, with Don Cherry and Charlie Hayden and Billy Higgins, you know, and it killed me. I realized, you know, okay, that's pure music, you know, and uh, it was so beautiful. Oh, that must have been amazing. Oh, it was oh incredible. It was a, a concert called A Love Supreme Night. So the, the whole first part was that. And the second part was all people who played with Strain. So uh, it was McCoy, Reggie Workman, Elvin Jones, Sonny Fortune, and uh, Freddie Hubbard. Wow. Pretty cool. Wow, what a hell of a concert. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Billy Higgins was, you know, he was a really, I mean, all of those people are, were incredible, but I, I had more of a personal relationship with Billy Higgins and he was, that music was 
and people who played with him, you know, like seriously played with him. That was a really different, I don't know if the genre is the correct word, but there was this different universe that they they were in. And I, I remember playing with um, with him and a, and a few other people uh, of his ilk. And it was just like this little funky little gig in, you know, Torrance in a Japanese <laughs> club, you know. Wow. And I was so shocked and blown away by being in that universe. I was, yeah. I just, I, ne I had never experienced anything like that. Now, I, I believe I, you. Yeah, I don't think I've ever experienced it again, actually, because that was a really mm -hmm. particular, yeah, particular group of people or I mean, I, I, that was one of my dreams was to play with him someday. I didn't get to. But what really blows my mind with people like him is is the, the, the width of his expression and how what he did, he didn't change what he was doing. It was him, purely him, but it worked with so many different things, you know, like, like uh, I mean, he's on Watermelon Man, for God's sake. You know, he's there and he's with Ornette and he's in uh, Cedar Walton's trio forever. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's so brilliant. Yeah. It's like Dennis Irwin, you know, I miss Dennis so much. I mean, Dennis was was uh, Mel Lewis's bass player in the big band. Uh, he was playing a lot with Lovano. He was playing a lot with Schofield, you know, in, in all those recordings with, with Larry Goldings and, uh, and Bill, Bill Stewart and Joe and, uh, and Eddie Harris and all those guys, you know, and, and he could play totally trad stuff you know he could play he could play really dixieland music yeah and he was always himself but yeah. it fits always you know it's so inspiring for me <laughs> yeah that's like uh oh this is not the same musically but this guy ross tompkins who was a pianist he was here in la and he was he was like a singer's dream accompanist and he played on the Tonight Show and blah blah blah. Anyway, he was very standard oriented. You right. Know? I mean, he knew uh, the verses, and he really—I mean, he was a standard type of player. But he played with rock people on the East Coast. It's like, really? You know, you just—you um, uh, know—it's just—it's amazing that when people can actually do that, you know. And in a way, it totally makes sense. It's all music, you know. And if you're if you're willing to 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 really try, and go with the flow and and go with the with the style of the thing, yeah, then it makes total sense. Yeah, you know my 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 friend drummer that I was mentioning earlier, Bruno Castellucci. I mean, this guy, like I said, he was 42 years with Toots, but he was also a lot on the road with Jacob Astorius. He was uh, recording with, with Herbie, uh, touring with Schofield, uh, playing with, with Chaka Khan, you know, with all those people. Chet Baker was Bill Frizzell, you know, and, uh, but he was also, do you, do you know this, this pop hit from the 80s called Born to be Alive, Patrick Hernandez? He was on there, you know, he was on everything, this guy. It's ridiculous, you know, he can, he can do all those different things. And he's a fantastic jazz drummer and he's a killer Brazilian music drummer. I have this band now with him called uh, Rio de Jazeiro, which is my, my view as a jazz man of Brazilian music. And um, I mean, they, he did a tour with Toots in Brazil a few years back and there was an article in the Brazilian press about him saying, finally, a foreigner who can play our shit, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, people, people like that are, are treasures because they, they, they have their own brand of stuff and they are just being themselves but they can they can give so much to so many different kinds of, of other styles. I don't know. It's it's just inspiring to me. It's like that food thing we were talking about, the recipe, you know. Right. It's uh, kind of put that in there. And the, yeah, right. that's what uh, I was telling you about this vibes player, Nick Mancini, and the drummer is so much like that. He's Steve Haas. He's just he's he whatever music comes up he puts himself in and it's better right 
you know, it's so like, beautiful. Yeah, just really, really good. Um, yeah. <laughs> I heard this. This is kind of a funny com thing to bring up, but I, w I watched this really. It's just a movie. It's a good feeling movie. It's called Chef. It's about this guy who gets a uh, food truck going. And it's just a nice feeling movie. No no death and destruction in it. You know, no like, whoops, something bad happens. It's just a good story that builds up into a happy ending. <laughs> but um, they're, his partner and his son, they're all working on the food truck together. And one at one point they're just relaxing and you know, just having a good time, having a beer. And um, a reggae version of um, Marvin Gaye's um, Sexual Healing comes up and they're singing. <laughs> and it is the coolest version. I've really been meaning to go back and listen to it because it's like, oh my God, yeah, perfect, you know? <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Have you seen this film yesterday? No. Oh, you have to see that. It's about this guy uh, in England who was uh, a oh. singer who's, who's trying to make it, you know, with yeah. his own music and everything and nothing goes right. And then he has an accident. Uh, yes. The, the power goes off in the whole city, apparently <laughs> in the whole world at the same time. And he has an accident. He's hit by a bus on his bicycle. And then when he goes out, his friends give him a new guitar because his guitar was broken in the accident. And to thank them, he plays and sings a Beatles tune and they don't recognize it. And actually everybody in the world forgot the Beatles. <laughs> that was a great movie. Oh, it's so great. I love and that he, film. He keeps like bringing up the songs right. the Beatles and nobody knows. And everybody b oh, believes yeah. that he wrote the, those yeah. songs, you know, and everybody falls in love with his music. You know, it's so great. That's a great movie. I like yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so how, how did the pandemic affect you? A lot. <laughs> I, mean, yeah. uh, I mean, everything just like, just like for you in the States, everything was just came to a, a direct shutdown, you know, everything was stopped. And, um, I think we, we had a, a little bit of a better safety net here in Europe, uh, in the way that, uh, the state not very much mind you but we're still supporting us a little bit to uh, to receive a little money every month uh, so that we wouldn't all go bankrupt you know and would be able to make it until the end of this long tunnel um, so i really appreciated that i had a lot of gratitude for that of course but also i mean for me it it had a, a silver lining in, in this that my son was born uh, in June 2020 in the middle of the pandemics and so I was forced to be at home for for his first year almost you know and oh, it was wow. incredible yeah. it was great yeah. to be with him and with my daughter you know he's he just turned two now and my daughter will be five in in uh, uh, a few days actually and uh, it's been incredible to spend that time with my family at home. That was really wonderful. But you know, like a lot of people, I was teaching online and uh, I had to learn how to teach without really playing with my students, which was interesting. I love playing with my students. and uh, But actually I love teaching that way too. It was very, very challenging at times, but it really worked as well. And I've learned new things and new ways to do things. So that was great. And I did a few of those videos in confinement, you know, uh, which maybe you've seen. I don't know. Uh, some, I haven't actually seen them. Yeah, there's okay. some really nice stuff, actually. But uh, we don't have time to play everything. It's it's getting like it's getting play, later. We can play something else if you like it. Or I yeah, know, like uh, like I said, I have your list, but not, nothing's titled. So. Right. Well, I can play something from here. Maybe okay. um, there's um, there's a um, a band that I've had for for years yeah. with a string quartet and it's my band called um, All Strings Attached ah, so yeah. it's it's my trio jazz guitar trio with bass and drums and um, uh, a string quartet and my dear friend who's a soloist with the uh, with the opera or orchestra here in Brussels fantastic cellist Sebastien Walnier always puts those quartets for me always puts them together for me 
And when the, the pandemics hit, we were talking on the phone and we said, what can we do? And we talked about those arrangements. And he said, well, you know, I could play the, the, the four quartets parts on the cello. And so we did a, a confined version with just bass and four times the cello and me. So this is a tune called Inner Voyage. Oh God, that is so gorgeous! Oh, thank you. Um, can you could you put in the, in the chat which uh, link that is? Yeah, sure, sure. I'll, uh, yeah, that try and find is gorgeous. It wow. Did you dear. So did you do did you do more with that kind of um, that that groove or? Yeah, I mean, I didn't do more videos for that, but I have a I have a whole program for more than two sets in a concert, with a, with that string quartet stuff that I wrote. That's, um, that's just stunning. Oh, well, thank you so out. much. Uh, Roland said, "Was that the seed that led to, led you to record El Gaucho?" No, uh, what led me to record El Gaucho is different things. Actually, I. Um, I uh, what what was the title of what I just played inner 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 voyage inner voyage thank you I'm trying to find the the, the link while we're talking um, maybe I can find it actually yeah I got it it's in, it's on YouTube um, let me do that and then that and then copy. There you voyage, go. Jean Francois, all strings attached. Okay, is that all strings? Attached? No, it's not because it's with this. Oh yeah, yeah, maybe it is. Maybe it is all strings attached in confinement because it's not all the yes. strings. Let me let me just check to see that the well, it's I, I don't have to do it now. But, yep, that's it. Yeah, that's the one. Okay. But um, here I have I have the link for you in the chat here. Thank there. you. Sure. Um, what led me to record El Gaucho is, first of all, my love for Wayne Shorter. Uh, I think 
none of my albums as a leader are without at least one Wayne Shorter compositions. Um, for me, he's somebody who completely changed the way we write music and we play music, and uh, he's a total genius. Uh, he comes from another planet of beauty, and uh, I'm just, I adore him. And so, El Gaucho was a tune that I always liked of his, and also I was playing for many years with one of my dearest friends who lived in Berlin. She's from Puerto Rico and her name is uh, Catalina Segura and she's a, a great singer and we were doing boleros and tangos and she had a lot of stories about gauchos in her songs and people kind of identified them with me because I was always wearing cowboy boots and hats and stuff like that and so I was kind of the gaucho on the gig and then one day I was in New York and I used to dress all in black, you know, and I had this black hat and black scarf, black shirt. I remember, I remember those days. Right? Black yeah. boots and everything. <laughs> and you know, New Yorkers think really quickly. And so I, I was very late. I was going to Michael Borby's studio to, to pick up some uh, tapes. And uh, I was running out, like ejecting myself from the subway station. And this, this homeless guy sees me there and, he, and he's like, Yo, Zorro, where are you going? <laughs> you know, so I decided to write a tune called Zorro. And uh, that totally fit with the, the gaucho thing. So there you go. <laughs> Taylor wants to know if you were influenced by Philip Catherine. No, actually, yes and no. He used to be a friend. I won't go any deeper into that, but uh, he... He influenced me in the way that he came to play at a jam session that my parents organized to celebrate the, the fifth an anniversary of their record store. And he played standards that I knew very well in such a free way and in such a beautiful way that I thought, okay, maybe I should try to play guitar. So yes, he influenced me to play the guitar, yeah. but I never tried to sound like him. I think we, we have a, a huge common ground with Django and with Rene Thomas, who was uh, Sonny Rollins' favorite guitarist. He was a Belgian guitarist who recorded a lot with Stan Getz and with Chet Baker. And uh, he was um, Bobby Jaspar's best friend. Bobby Jaspar was this Belgian tenor player, flute player, clarinet player, who was married to Blossom Deary mm -hmm. and played with Wynton Kelly. And he played in Miles' band Between Train and Train. And uh, so these were great Belgian musicians and Bobby Bobby passed away very early and uh, and Rene, they were both terrible junkies and so they died way too early. Um, but Rene Thomas died a little later, he died in the mid 70s. Uh, and he also had this thing that came from Django, you know, all the guitar players in Belgium, we took something from Django, uh, Toots Tielemans also, when he played guitar, there was something that came from Django as well. There's this kind of... Um, he was swinging very hard, of course, Django, but it, there, there's this kind of crazy lyricism, you know, he was really m making the notes sing, you know, and, and I feel like that's our, that's our common thing with all the, all the guitar players here. And, and Philip is a great guitar player, of course, played with a lot of amazing musicians, but he was not an influence and he didn't want to teach me. And uh, so I never took lessons with him. I played with him several times and uh, he's still playing. He's uh 81 now i think or it will be 81 this year and um he uh he celebrated all over the place which is nice um well you know speaking of singing and stuff you're that last piece i mean it was stunning and it wasn't because yeah. you were um playing a lot of notes <laughs> it was uh you were so emotionally communicative and mm -hmm. Uh, there was this space and wow, it was just gorgeous, really beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, singing is my, my biggest inspiration and uh, I do try to sing every once in a while. I recorded one song on one CD and uh, it's the scariest thing on earth for me to sing mm -hmm. uh, because you can't even hide behind the instrument anymore, you know, but uh, it's the it's the most beautiful thing because it's the most natural thing and um, when I play I really try 
This is one thing that I work on with my students, actually. I forbid them to play something that they cannot sing. Uh -huh. Because if you cannot sing it, that means that you cannot hear it. Uh -huh. And uh, a lot of instrumentalists nowadays are amazing scientists and they have these wonderful theoretical ideas but sometimes it doesn't relate organically for me and um, for me it's important that you really understand what you're playing on an organic level on a physical level and if you cannot sing it even if you sing out of tune that's another problem but if you cannot interna internalize it in a way that you can really hear all the lines that you're playing that means they're not really your lines they're just mathematics and they sound like that you know well I have a similar thing about singers yeah Probably now because a lot of the younger singers who have come up are very adept at scales and you know they can jump all over the place but uh, they're not really delivering who they are and so yeah. it's boring to me yeah yeah i feel i feel I, I need a lot of emotion in the music and it can be all kinds of emotion it doesn't have to be always uh, you know sad or moving or something like that it can be something really angry or something really funny or whatever you know yeah. but i need to have an emotional bond with the music and uh, it has to groove and it has to it has to i i, I love to have the relationship with blues also you know, I, I, I feel very close to that. And um, I think that comes from Toots for me because he was always so funky, so bluesy, especially on the guitar. And uh, I think that's why Quincy loved him so much. My friend Clay Jenkins, who's a great, really unusual and great trumpet player and teacher, he's all uh, about the blues. If you can't do the blues, you're, he says, you know, you're not coming from. That's right from the right place you know that's right I think uh, I think you need that to be a jazz musician yeah, yeah. Uh, I have one last question from Taylor sure um, which I think is a really good question and Taylor not that your other questions aren't good but I'm just picking and choosing he he, he gives great uh, lists great questions I uh, he, he's wondering if you could talk about what your definition of virtuosity is hmm. I think I, I will borrow it from from Bill Evans um, somebody was asking him why did you record Round Midnight I mean it was written by Thelonious Monk this pianist who has no technique and you have such great technique why did you record Round Midnight and Bill Evans said well for me technique is the ability to execute what you hear and therefore Thelonious Monk has amazing technique <laughs> you know and I mean technique is close to virtuosity right so, I mean virtuosity is, is the ability to play very complicated stuff very quickly and uh, without without any any uh, how would I say it hesitations and stuff like that I mean virtuosity for me does not mean that you have to win the Olympics of, of music and be fastest, uh, loudest, uh, all that stuff. To me, that's boring. Uh, and some people who play really quickly are really interesting to me because everything they play is interesting and is good and is, is valid. Yeah. But if I hear somebody just playing lines that don't come from anywhere and don't go anywhere and stay on the same uh, dynamic level, I, I reach my threshold very quickly. I mean, it's just, it doesn't mean anything for me. Um, I think that uh, people people have to breathe when they play music. And when you're singing, you're forced to breathe. When you're playing horns, unless you do uh, circular breathing all the time, you're forced to, to breathe. And um, this is really something that somebody told me that some uh, someday when I was starting. He said, man, you're breathing so loud when you're playing. What are you doing? And I realized that I was really taking air in before playing a phrase. And then when I had no more air, I had to take more air, you know? <laughs> and it's really like singing to me. It's like if you have to play like you're singing. And some people can take a lot of air, you know? <laughs> that's what virtuosity is. <laughs> well, that's a great question to end off on, believe it or not. It's two hours. Wow. 
Well, that's too short. I'm having a I lot know. of fun hanging out with you, dear I Kathy. Know. I gotta. I I have a big desire to come over and see you. <laughs> that would be great. Come over and sing. Yeah, I I Let's would play. love to. Um, I, I am going to France in November, but I don't think my husband could tolerate another adding another week <laughs> onto yeah. the trip. But I, I would definitely. Well, if you go to Paris, you know it's only an hour and twenty minutes by train. Oh, dig that! Cool. You know, Brussels is so central. If you drive with a car for a couple hours, you're in Paris, or you're in Amsterdam, or in London, or in Cologne in Germany. That's what I love about being here. It's been a long time since I was there. It's probably, let's see, I don't know, 30 years or something. I, you know, I had, I had, I had, <laughs> I had, I was traveling with the piano player that I normally traveled with in Japan. Mm -hmm. And, um, but we did a few gigs in, in uh, the Netherlands and um, yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah, we just had a yeah, that was interesting, right? In the Netherlands. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, we just had a fantastic tour with Darman. I think he told you about that a few yeah. weeks ago. Yeah, it was so much fun. It's great. He's so cool. And uh, we talked about them, but I didn't say that yet. I'm going to release uh, in the next few months. I think early next year is the plan. The new album that Judy Niemack recorded with Jay Clayton. Oh, yeah. I play on part of that, and uh, it's uh, it's called Voices in Flight. It's really beautiful. Yeah, this is, uh, and this is your um, right, your label page. Let me see if I can just make this a little bigger. And um, yeah, uh, Roland, thanks for posting this. Um, yeah, so wow, look at that. been doing this a long time yeah I have to check her out oh Maria is great she's her music is, is impossible to classify which I like already she's a virtuoso harpist huh. and she has a beautiful voice uh, and she writes her own music and sometimes it's like uh, singer-songwriter stuff so like country folk more like pop, more like jazz, more like classical. Yeah. And um, I wrote a couple of lyrics for her for that album. Uh, a feminist lyric and a, a socialist lyric. And it's really fun. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I have my work cut out for me. I'm going to be checking checking out your stuff, man. Yeah, thanks. And um, it's cool. Well, Jean-Francois, it's so nice to see you and talk with you. I'd, I'd give you a hug if I could. <laughs> Big hugs coming your way too, and uh, let's do that in person soon. I would like to. Maybe I can arrange for a, tr uh, a, a, a train trip over to Brussels while I'm there. Um, yeah, it'd be fun. I am. Um, everybody, uh, tomorrow is a very unusual. I don't know if you know the singer, but Yumi Ito. No. Very unusual singer. Really. Great. Um, very good. Uh, and um, then the next day, um, a guy originally from Uruguay, who's a bass player, and he's, he's got a very interesting history, how he came up. And he came up, he was young, he was like 20 or something, and he was always playing bass, and Uruguay was going through a lot of social, political stuff at that time, and he won the lottery. <laughs> He's one of the people who did. <laughs> Unbelievable! So that changed wow. his life, and yeah. and on and on. He's got it's a it's a very interesting story. So those are my the rest of my live guests this week, and then of course Thursday through Sunday I'll go back to the archives. Um, so um, everybody uh, have a great time this week wherever you are on the planet, and uh, Jean Francois have a have a. Uh, maybe you're going to sleep now. Yeah, because my kids wake up very early in the morning. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, it's 11 I, we p.m. We have to talk here. more because I want to. I want to know how your life has gone, you know, personally and stuff. So uh, yeah, we'll have to call sure. and talk to each other too. Thank you so much. It was great. <laughs> and thank you everybody for checking in.